your normal individual who's just absorbing the the propaganda that would have people nodding their heads in agreement when our fellow man's rights are stripped from them. We don't really um, think things through on our own usually, and we also look for reasons to remain comfortable. Welcome to Grief Heals, the podcast that explores how grief heals. Join us as we consider how grief invites love within ourselves, our communities, our world, our histories, and how it is that grief heals. I'm Lisa Michelle Zega here with Eric Simpson. Hey, Eric. How are you doing? Actually, I'm doing really good. I've had a great night's sleep. I'm in a hotel room. I'm using a towel as a pillow, which has actually been really good. And I get to wake up in the morning and go for walks on the beach, and that's pretty amazing. And yeah, so overall, I am, and I'm looking forward to a day of hard work, uh, physical labor. So it feels good to move are... my body that way. You are not on the, because you've mentioned before you live in the Los Angeles area, but you are not at the LA beach right now. I am not. I am on an East Coast beach. Yeah, yeah. That's scary. You know what trips me out is all the shells. Now, it's not just on the East Coast that I've seen this. It, it's also like in Texas, whatever, there's so many shells. How come I never see shells when I walk on the beaches in California? I don't, I don't get it. I don't know. I've, I've seen them. <laughs> I, well, not not like here they're riddled. It's like you. you in yeah. fact, in Texas, when I walk on the beach, it's like there's so many broken shells. It's part of the. I, I don't know. I Maybe I'm mystified. There's just more people on the California beach up in Northern California. And so California. we're smashing all the shells and grinding them into the sand. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. In Northern well, California, there are, are plenty of shells, and in the Oregon coast. Not in Southern so, California. Yeah. Well. Not well, in my experience. That's, that's because they have to pay a certain amount of money to the Hollywood executives, like in the film industry, in order to be decorative on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we digress. So, well, we well, digress from what we've barely even started. But yes, I'm I'm on the East Coast, and I'm I'm here. I'm I'm supporting my girlfriend, her brother past. And so even though from my room, it looks like I'm on vacation. And in some ways, I very much am. And I'm also entering the suffering of my beautiful friend. And that's that's what's going on. Writing Straight with Crooked Lines, just the title had me. Right. And I had no idea how that was going to weave in with what I'm up to and what I'm experiencing and enter me into an like, Eric, I'll tell you this, in the world of social justice, I am an utter novice. In the world of really, really diving into the systems that oppress, I feel like I am a novice, even though in that realm in some way, well, it doesn't matter. My brain is wanting to interject and tell me all the other things that I have been doing, but I, I'm blown away by my ignorance and not in a way that um criticizes me in any way just just how it is but that i'm 53 years old and just learning about some things and i don't know reading about the mccarran act my my whole way that i grew up indoctrinated around you know like there was a communist on the corner that was coming to bring down my country and 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 then also how that is weaving together with my experience of working with men who are technically still incarcerated and stories they're telling me and mm -hmm. it, yeah yeah i'm having i'm having some thoughts i'm having a lot of big emotions so i have not read the book but i know jim forrest who passed away in january of 2022 i guess i'm interested in you know what some of the ideas you're talking about, what the McCarran Act is, because I don't know what that is. Well, it's basically gave our government the 
right to imprison, interrogate anyone that was suspected of being a usurper okay. of the government. Okay. It, it, it's reminding me somewhat of the Patriot Act, but it just right. shows me how far these things go, how, how, how deep it is. And I believe it was Jim's father who was imprisoned as a result or under that act. Right. And, and then later finding out the different people that were suspected by the FBI. And, and there right. are these like social activists who are doing such great, peaceful, beautiful work in the world. And, right. and yet, you know, your, your normal individual who's just absorbing the, the propaganda that would have people nodding their heads in agreement when our fellow man's rights are stripped from them. We don't really um, think things through on our own, usually. And we also look for reasons to remain comfortable and not yeah. understand the reality that we are living in and how we are suffering when others are suffering. And so that makes us responsible, not only for our own lives, but for all life. Well, it's so interesting to me because the passage that's been in my head, and I haven't looked it up recently to say, oh, am I quoting this right? But it's just been tickling my brain is I was hungry and you didn't feed me. Mm -hmm. I was imprisoned and you didn't visit me. Mm -hmm. And this idea of, Lord, when were you hungry? When were you in prison? Right. This is how I came to the conclusion, Eric, that grief is love. It was through the passage of entering my own grief that I came to the conclusion that we are all connected so deeply. And now I'm looking and I'm like, wait a minute, this is, this isn't, is this? I think this is what God is saying in these passages. What you do to your fellow man or what you do not do for your fellow man, mm -hmm. you do to me. We are, in fact, all connected. Right. So when I ignore my suffering, I ignore yours. And oh my gosh, this is how I see it play out in the world. This is why I think it is so brave and courageous to enter our own human experience, to be with the feelings of of the sensations in my body that arouse when I think about my own life experience and entering there, I'm able to see, I'm able to see my fellow man locked up behind bars without in a system that is not just all about like good guys and bad guys or any other cowboy and Indian narrative that we've been sold since childhood. I think that there, there are ideological constructs that motivate economic systems medical systems, just all the all the different ways in which we seek to function as a society, the institutions that are created in order to help us to function as a healthy society. And so it's it's not just the fact that there are a whole lot of people being served by the institutions and that some of the people in the institutions might, you know, have a certain amount of power and become corrupt and exercise their power in a wrong way. But I think it's more just that there are certain ideologies in, in any system, wherever you are, that influence the way that things are carried out. I mean, we could, in a perfect world, we could live in a place where we can all have food, have uh, sustenance. And when we go to the doctor, the doctor could have the resources to fully understand our health history and answer all of our questions and give us what we need for our health, and, and that includes mental health, you know, when, when there are problems in families, we could live in a society where the social worker teams up with uh, mental health professionals and other people in, in order to understand all the dynamics that are going on in a family in order to resolve issues that prevent the family from being healthy. There might be something cropping up like child abuse or something like that. What happens, just take, taking that for an example, is um, if a parent is accused of abusing a child because they don't have the resources or the money or the time 
and because they are usually ultimately for profit and we see that as axiomatic axiomatically a good thing production and profit those are the things that we value they aren't able to see the full picture and so they just automatically presume guilt and then look for reasons to either justify it or not in most cases because they want to protect the child so so the 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 main impetus is to protect the child and this is just an example that i'm talking about and when we're talking about any kind of system there could be institutions and systems that function in a way that is conducive to the health of everyone and and the health of the society but that doesn't exist because of what we value and what we believe you know what our ideas are even if they're not conscious ideas about the nature of reality really and so in in our system it's not just the fact that people are treated as non-human or dehumanized but they're dehumanized because we believe that we need to make money we need to be productive and that seen as being we need to use the most efficient way of doing that and that's a good thing and so basically i mean all i'm saying is it's capitalism that that imbues our system it's not just the fact that it's a system i wanted to hear you say the ideology yeah. that is right injected well, into the system yeah say keep going and and it could and you know this could be the other ideologies and other systems that that create more problems than solutions um and this is a very deep it's not a topic we can really get into to any depth both, both because of my lack of knowledge but also we just wouldn't have the time or resources or money so we need to <laughs> so with that being said what part would be relevant to talk about you know like where right well i think that in the case of jim forrest and the people that he influenced him that he talked about were people like dorothy day who is probably going to be recognized as a saint in the Roman Catholic Church at some point. And people like Thomas Merton, who wrote about peace and war, among many other things. And people like Thich Nhat Hanh, who, when he was working for the um, Fellowship of Reconciliation, as a young man, Jim Forrest traveled for a year with Thich Nhat Hanh in the United States. And you reminded me, talking about Thich Nhat Hanh, he talked about a concept called interbeing, and he uses this to explain Buddhist concepts about selfhood and emptiness, that emptiness isn't actually empty, but that all of the, the things that constitute who you are, for instance, not all of them are you know, human. You have DNA in you that's not human DNA, and you have all the different influences just from the sun, from the environment, from other people. The whole world, he says, is in each cell of our body. You know, that's so that's the way that he talked about it. And 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 interbeing means that there's this huge connection and that things that we do and habits that we form continue on because they are a part of us. That's what constitutes what we think of as the self. The self, though, doesn't have some little man in there this is the buddhist concept and i don't know if it's true or not but it i suspect that it can resonate with people and it makes a lot of sense to me there's not a little man inside me operating things but if you took out all the parts of me that aren't me but ha are come from somewhere else there would be nothing left <laughs> it would be empty because there's no self aside from that though the main point is that we're all within each other i'm in you and you are in me and we're all responsible for each other and within the i'm talking a lot i'm sorry but within the history of christianity that exists as well there are um, theologians who talk about human essence or human being being one being and that that means that when someone else commits a sin it's as if we also committed the sin and we're in some way responsible to repent from that the the, the action that motivates us is love and so our love for other people helps us not only to you know to i guess they would call that intercessory prayer mm. or intercessions but it's like an intercession of being an intercession of 
of taking on ourselves all the joys of the world as well as the responsibilities for yeah. our neighbor and our enemy as well. I mean, Jim Forrest wrote a book about that too, um, Loving Your Enemy. I, well, having uh, entered his memoir, I definitely plan to read more of his writings. He's already changed my life. And as you were talking about the concept of inner being, when I look to my left, what I see is ocean, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about how when I drive in Texas and I'm looking at the different bayous and streams, I see so much trash. And there is such a disconnect, Eric, between what we put in our water and what we're putting in our body what we put in our atmosphere and what's coming to our body, what we put in our food, what's so like this, I was, I was thinking in very just simple, practical terms, how whatever I do to my environment is what I am mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to me, right. right? Whatever is happens to my fellow man. And then in practical terms. So I, I mentioned early on that I'm with my girlfriend, right? Who loves her brother who wants for her brother to like give to him. And I've been thinking as we are with his things and with one another, that as, as we are loving each other, as we are caring for his items, as we are like, we are sending him love. Or, I mean, we are loving him like really in real time. Mm -hmm. But and then I was also thinking right before I came here, I when I work this one contract, I stay with my girlfriend's mom. And one of the things I do for her is I I mop her floor. And when I'm mopping her floor, I am recognizing I am doing this one what I want done for everyone. I want people loved and cared for and 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 then okay well when I drink this water mm. and nourish my body I'm doing for one what I, I I I don't know and then that passage has really been tickling my brain about hey where were you where were you when I was thirsty where were you right. So I think one of the things that when I started talking about all that that I was that motivated me to begin speaking, but I never got to it, was the <laughs> whole idea that I don't think Jim Forrest or Dorothy Day or um, Thich Nhat Hanh or Thomas Merton, uh, Jim Forrest also knew the Berrigan brothers who are more well-known in Roman Catholic circles, but they were activists. I don't think any of them, I don't think any of them thought of themselves as predominantly just thinking, you know, I'm just into social justice. But what they're mm -hmm. thinking about is this connection and about what it yeah. means to to love yeah. your neighbor and to love your enemy. Yeah. It, you know, it's, I feel like I sound like a broken record and I'm just allowing for that. It's, it's only my human experience mm -hmm. that entering grief is what for me personally see before i hadn't read i i've read like a thumbnail sketch of thomas merton mm -hmm. i hadn't been introduced to dorothy day to jim forrest the barrage brothers i i don't have the same wealth of reading mm -hmm. that that you do and how is it that i've come to conclusions of these people that i'm like in awe of and and i and i think it's because see grief humanizes it you know like i value authenticity i value realness and and i feared that i wasn't even real and yet and this became a portal for me into reality into authenticity into love so that now I feel like I'm being called to go places I never, ever envisioned for myself. But it's not because I think of myself as a social activist right. or someone who's, no, it's because I'm now entering the world of connection and the world of love. And perhaps there's many, many roads to get one there. Mm -hmm. For me, the road was entering grief and recognizing that it was love. Like, at least it was the hand of love for me. Mm 
It mm. is. It, I, I'm not, I can't speak in past, past tense about this. Grief is the hand of love for me that leads me to, to real, to life, and away from programming and automation and robotic and and just is helping me to see how much of my own life my own existence right. has been lived on autopilot and how much of it has been influenced by what i was programmed to believe and think about myself or my fellow man including that my value in this world is my productivity right to be a productive member of society. Like now I hear that term and it's like, it sounds like a line in a factory. Yeah. Production, to be on a production line. Mm. So. What was the slogan above the gates of Auschwitz? Work sets you free. Capitalist systems work enslaves us. We, we rent out our bodies for eight yes. or 10 hours a day. But what's interesting to me too is uh, Jim Forrest was also influenced by another person who's like Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton, et cetera, who he never met. Her name is Maria Skopsova, and she was a Russian woman who was involved in the revolutionary spirit in the early part of the 20th century. I think she married and divorced and had a child I don't remember the exact chronology of her life, but she ended up in Paris and her daughter died uh, when she was young. I don't like five or six years old of um, tuberculosis, I believe. And she sat by her bed the entire time. And the grief that she experienced through the death of her daughter was in, in her biography. It was the single event that completely changed her entire life and that now she's been canonized as a saint because of the witness of her life. Uh, Maria Skopsova ended up becoming a nun and living in Paris during the Nazi occupation. And she resisted by hiding children in garbage cans oh. and moving them out of the country that, or out of danger in that way. And Jim Forrest actually wrote a children's book on that as well. But Oh, wow. That is entering our own suffering. And like Maria was entering also the suffering of her daughter. Mm -hmm. And what that resulted in was her unable to shut her eyes to the suffering of others. And right. it like, right, like love ushered her forward. But knowing what I hear from people and the pressure to be a certain way and the pressure for even grief to be productive and you know, to move on quickly and to get back to yourself and to be what people want you to be. And I'm simply saying, hey, no, we've all we've all got a unique way to heal. I mean, to put it in spiritual terms, we each have our own measure of grace. And, and grace, yes. grace yes. is defined not the way that we used to define it, but grace as the mystery of the presence of the divine. The transcendent, you might see all kinds of things as exemplifying grace. In the Hebrew scriptures, there's a story of the burning bush that consumes the plant in order to burn, but doesn't consume the plant. Mm. And that's sort of a manifestation of the mystery of grace or what has been through the Latinization of the word mysterium become known as sacrament in the churches. Um, and so, that's why the churches end up saying, this is a huge digression. <laughs> so the churches <laughs> end up saying that we uh, experience grace in cooperation with God sacramentally. But I think there's you can see it more broadly than that. So that when St. Maria Skopsova was finally arrested by the Nazis and she was sent to a concentration camp at Ravensbrück and was there for some time in, when she as the story goes, put herself in the place of someone who was going to be killed, and they killed her instead. And she was able to do that, I think, because of the measure of grace that she had. <sighs> I might not have that same measure of grace, but I'm responsible for whatever measure of grace that I have to to love, to be to accept myself where I am and to love 
other people that I come into contact with and to love my enemy and to have them because I am my enemy. Yeah. This is, this is, um, my heart is open and I'm so grateful that you shared her story that just that little bit of her story Mm -hmm. with us as, and help helped us to understand the mystery of grace. So thank you. Thank you all who are listening and we will be back with you again next week for another episode of grief heals where we explore how grief heals ourselves one another and our world and brings love been listening to Grief Heals with Lisa Michelle Zega. The podcast is produced by me, Eric Simpson, in association with Jump Up and Down Productions. Music by Ken Dalian, Drunken Nights to Sunday Mornings, and Stefan Carlin, A Calming Ocean, A Common Notion. If you would like more information about the work Lisa does, point your browsers to legitu.com. That's L-E-G-I-T-Y-O-U. Lisa can also be reached at Lisa Michelle at LegitU.com. This has been a Jump Up and Down production.